you know, if it doesn't have meaning, <clears throat> uh, we sure wasted a lot of time in church with it. If, if we're only including it for aesthetics, if we're just, if the only reason we use music in church is beauty, now I, I, I believe in beauty, I believe in aesthetics. I put on my blog the other day, it's one thing to say, give of your best to the master, and it's another thing to take voice lessons so that you can give your best to the master. It's one thing to, to sing, to play, give your best to the master, and it's another thing to take piano lessons. And so, <clears throat> I believe in aesthetics. I believe our musicking, the act of doing, should be beautiful. Uh, I believe God created music, and he created it not only beautiful, but very beautiful. Yes. Because he's smart, you see, and he took nothing and made something, and he created it in a very beautiful and very meaningful fashion. Okay. If there is intrinsic or embodied meaning, one may well ask what meaning is embodied and how it is, is apprehended. An extreme formalist would say that the acoustic pattern itself and nothing more is the sense of music. Hanslick indeed said this, though he did not hold consistently to the view. <clears throat> but most non-referentialists regard music as, in one way or another, Emotionally meaningful and expressive. We need some modifiers or articles in the of that. Ah, it is one thing to say that music's meaning is all on the inside, but it's another thing to follow through with it in your philosophy. My two cents is: ooh, these formalists start out this way. But down the line in their writings, they begin to sort of <laughs> admit that music has meaning more than just the acoustic patterns within in the formal properties of the music. Interesting, interesting view, but I think it's the truth. Referentialists, too, find expressive content in music. Though this emotional content may be extra musical, even if not explicit in origin, according to the American theorist John Hospers in Meaning and Truth in the Arts. And another guy. Okay, so uh, referentialists, true referentialists, have a tendency, strict referentialists, the music's meaning is all outside of itself. I can't be a referentialist under those conditions. So I have to, I'm way over there in the corner here, out on the outskirts of the camp here, because uh, when we go there, I think music prefers all the, all the time outside of itself, if it's expressive music. And the more we know about music, when we come to the music experience, the more it's going to refer outside of itself. I will tell you, if I go down here to the Cincinnati Symphony and I sit there, they're playing Dvorak's New World Symphony or whatever, not religious, not intended to be religious, no prayer at the beginning, no religious words, no religious reference. When I go away from there and I walk down the sidewalk to my old car, I'm going to be glorying in what my God created. And part of the aesthetic experience that I experienced there will be hooked to religious experience. And don't misunderstand me. There's a difference between religious experience and aesthetic experience. But I will tell you something that I cannot observe aesthetic presentations of, of, excuse me, of music and not receive understanding outside of music itself. Meyer, Leonard B., uh, has made the observation that whilst most referentialists are expressionists, not all expressionists are referentialists. <laughs> I love philosophers. Okay, 
While most referentialists are expressionists, not all expressionists are referentialists. So, expressionists believe that music expresses emotions, and referentialists, who is an expressionist, would believe that it refers, it refers expressions that are outside of music. If you're strict, they all have to be outside of music, and I'm not strict in that sense, so I would say they wouldn't all have to come outside of music. He makes the, the uh, useful distinction between absolute expressionists and referential expressionists and identifies his own position as, look at this, I love this, this, this makes me laugh. Formalist, absolutist, expressionist. <laughs> yes, okay, so he, he just uses them all. <clears throat> In acknowledging that music can and does express referential designated meanings as well as non-referential ones, Meyer exhibits a permissive view. He has been criticized for failing to make clear the modus operandi of his referential meaning in music. Now I will tell you <laughs> that whoever wrote that I uh, was uh, chipping away at him because of, he believed in referential meaning. Uh, I, I, I don't think, I'm not, I do not agree totally with Leonard B. Meyer, and I sort of take his philosophy and run with it, I'll admit that. By the way, that's something else. As I, uh, as I write, and as I post my position, and I contend for something, I more and more look at, now where is somebody going to take this and run with it? Am I going to cause somebody to run off with this? And, and do, I, do I say things I don't thoroughly mean? And I think at times we have all done that. Uh, we don't have to deal with these uh, books. There's some books here that, uh, <clears throat> that are by famous uh, philosophers that we don't have to deal with. Okay, aesthetic music education. What would you suppose aesthetic music education means? What that term would mean? Is that a type of music that is not theology? Uh, it's more art. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, yes, it is more artistic. We say at, that, that aesthetics is that area of philosophy that deals with beauty rather than utility. Utilities. So aesthetic music education would be the aim of music education is to center our attention on aesthetic performance and aesthetic listening. Well, you know, if you go to arguing with that from the surface, that's like arguing against grandmother and her apple pie. You know, nobody wants a high school band to perform unesthetically. Nobody wants to hear somebody play piano and just rip off the notes. But back in the mid-20th century, music educators became concerned about the quality of music education in public schools in the United States. Christian education at that time, don't slaughter me, but was not a major thing in the, in the 50s. Okay, there were lots and lots and lots of Christian families that sent their kids to public school. I started out in a public school, but my folks decided along the way that what I was bringing home was not good to a whole life philosophy. And so therefore, about the fourth grade, uh, they put me in a Christian school. Uh, I was born in 48, so you can see I came, I discovered America about mid-century. So aesthetic music education came along. There was the aesthetic education movement. And Bennett Reamer, among others, was, was 
one of these early music educators, oh, say early, mid-century, there we go, music educators that was concerned about the quality of music education. And so he, he was concerned, so he began to write on aesthetic performance, aesthetic listening, and having aesthetic experiences with the music. And so more than just mind wallowing in this, that a person would perceive import when they listen to music beyond the mere nuts and bolts of the music. That I agree with. Frankly, what I think happened to music education in the United States was that as families got less and less control of their children, and as in the elementary classroom it became easier to keep these kids quiet by listening to music with a call chart in front of them, or having them draw pictures of what the music represented or whatever, <coughs> than it was to put these kids out here with pre-band instruments <coughs> or beginning band instruments, or to teach these kids in elementary music the names of the lines and spaces, time signatures, key signatures, and for these kids to leave grade school knowing the nuts and bolts of music. And so generation after generation, and this might be a little harsh, of, of public school and private school kids left the elementary school and the junior high school and went into high school not knowing, after having eight years of elementary music, not knowing the names of the lines and spaces not being able to really tell you really what 4-4 four, four meant, 4-4 four, four time, or not being able to tell you how having three flats out here in the signature, what that really meant to the music that you were viewing here, until they, they would look at a piece of written music and it would be as foreign to them as reading a, a Greek magazine. Again, you know, I'm, I'm being a little hard. I grew up on the aesthetic music education concept. Well, not really grew up, but when I got to college, you weren't anybody unless you believed in aesthetic music education. And like I say, to, to sit here and argue against beauty and import in music, <clears throat> beyond the nuts and bolts of music, is to argue against grandmother. But along came a person named uh, Elliot Carter, I think it was, who uh, wrote this book. Somewhere here. That started at Firestore. Somewhere here, right here. Okay. David Elliot. David Elliot wrote Music Matters, a new philosophy of music education. This book was not about having aesthetic experiences with music, but he was saying that, that music is a human experience and that music is about doing, not about just listening and drawing pictures of mountains while you do this. If we're going to have people who are literate in music, they need to leave our music classrooms knowing how to read it and write it and perform it. And anything less is a goal that is short of what ought to happen. What happened is we decided we wanted people to appreciate music, whatever that means. And so therefore, uh, we started all these music appreciation classes. And you know, there's nothing wrong with appreciating music. But it is my contention, after studying after people like David Elliott, that you cannot really appreciate music 
and really continued to have aesthetic experiences with music until you understand music and that doers understand. You see, the Bible says don't be a hearer of the word only, but be a doer. doer. Yeah. Be a doer. And that's what needs to happen <clears throat> in music education is the people who leave our schools need to be able to do music. The Bible says that we learn line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And that's exactly what needs to happen in, in music education. To be able to sit and smile while you listen to music and draw pictures and follow uh, flow charts is fine, but it doesn't replace the need and necessity of leaving our Christian schools, being able to read and write and perform music. That is not popular. What would happen in our Christian schools if the math teacher got up and said, no tests, no homework, because I want you to appreciate math. And the English teacher said, no tests, no homework, no verbs, no nouns, no adjectives. I want you to appreciate the English language. And so down the line, our biology teacher said, no cutting up of frogs, <laughs> not in my class. You see, when you study biology with me, I want you to appreciate frogs. What would happen to the study of English and math and history and biology and chemistry? Oh yeah, no, <clears throat> no mixing of chemicals in my class. <clears throat> Matter of fact, that philosophy has permeated Christian education so much that a lot of Christian institutions quit having labs <coughs> in, in chemistry and biology. Can you imagine that? Graduating people who've had biology and chemistry without ever ha uh, mixing anything up in a beaker and <laughs> having it go poof. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> Bennett Reamer believed that music education needed a more academic, credible basis upon which to justify music education in the school curriculum. What was going on? We can beat up on Bennett Reamer and those guys if we want to, but what went on before aesthetic music education was worse. Now, amongst all of this, <coughs> there were music educators out there before aesthetic music education in the first half of the 20th century that their kids left their elementary classroom and left the high school and, and knowing how to read and write and perform music. What do we do with this? Because music education has to be, it has to be practical. Yesterday I read to you out of the book of Chronicles the fact that they had, they were, were ward against ward, the teachers and scholars, and they were instructed in, in the songs of the Lord. Real, true, quality music and instruction has to happen in the Christian school. Now, I have another conviction. I have a conviction that this was never the responsibility of the public schools to train our children with music. It wasn't their responsibility. Ah, uh, matter of fact, typ typically, the first attempts <clears throat> at music education in America were the singing schools, where 
an itinerant musician, went around to churches. I'm going to go slowly so that will sink in. Not to public schools, but to churches. And taught them how to read, write, and perform music. The church in early America trained their own. You could say, well, the whole shape note system, and it wasn't a good system. And, and I will tell you, a lot of people came out of that, that, that southern note reading thing, and that whole idea of shape notes, and read music a lot better than, than I ever did when I came out of the public schools or out of a Christian school as an eighth grader. And so I'm not going to make fun of shape notes or the itinerant uh, singing schools in early American education. But the church fathers decided that, that it was a bad idea, and I, I don't have time to teach all about that, but it's the truth. The church shot music education in the foot. We're our worst enemy. And so people in churches weren't getting any music education. And so Lowell Mason taught music in the Boston public schools for a year for nothing. And he had a number of, of, of things that he brought before the, the Board of Education in Boston. One of the reasons he said we need to do this in the public school, it will be wonderful for devotions in, in the morning. <laughs> Can you imagine now that picking up a, a, a music text in a public school and saying, one of the justifications for having music education is to help us uh, sing about the Lord when we have devotions in the morning. You know, now we've mandated in this great country that we cannot retain God in our knowledge. Anyway, Wolf is on his soapbox. You can tell him he's getting red faced. You know, but I will, I will have to go on here, but I will tell you, in, in early American education, it was the responsibility of the church. In the Old Testament, Music education was the responsibility of the church. And church people gave. Heman, Jeduthun, and Ethan, they, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, those chief musicians were responsible for the organization of music education. And it was taught in the temple. Oh, wow. So, Music education in early America was taught in the church.